Hi, I am so appreciative you all are here. Uh, it's so beautiful outside. I can't imagine I, um, what brought you inside, so I'm, I'm thrilled. <laughs> I'm, I, I literally was like walking in, coming here from the train and thinking, what an extraordinary day. People will go inside to listen to my talk about experiencing things. Um, so I am here, my name, as she said, is Michael Tara Garver. I am thrilled to be here. Um, it's interesting talking about the art of experience amidst a festival. Um, in particular, festivals to me are extraordinary moments when all of these different things are intersecting and they're happening in different places all at the same time and we find ourselves amidst it. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about constellations today because it's a, it's a metaphor that makes a lot of sense to me and really great festivals are like a constellation. You yourself right now are a tiny star amidst this constellation and you feel yourself a part of it and hopefully and ideally today we connect in some way that makes you feel a part of the larger landscape of what are international arts and ideas. Um, and I also would just say, you know, the way I wanna start this is, uh, <laughs> I, I don't even remember anymore when this quote happened, so we'll just say in the last couple of years, The Guardian, a couple of other people, proclaimed that we are now, everyone stop, we are in the age of experience. I don't know if you knew this, <laughs> but live things now matter. And as somebody who started in theater, um, I, I'll tell you a little bit about that. It, it was about 20 years ago I started saying, you know what'll be super interesting? I think what we do, where people think there's a small little theaters in the basements, it's going to matter. I, I think it does, but I think we're really going to matter at some point because there's an art in the live and we're focusing on the arts of everything else right now. And, and you know, I, I wasn't, I was also um, at the time, I was in Chicago. Um, and is anybody here from Chicago or know Chicago well? I, I may be wrong. I think Chicago is similar to a culture of New Haven, which is you do the work. Maybe it's a little different. You don't talk about the work. You don't uh, give talks about the work. You do it. And so in Chicago, we were just doing the work. We weren't saying like, gosh, this live thing we're doing, it's so important. We were just doing it. And we were also connecting with community. It was a huge, incredible space. But as I started to evolve as an artist, I realized that I started to see more and more as we were having digital moments, um, they're not bad, but we didn't know anymore how to put them away to go have a live moment. We were stuck. Um, and so this age of experience, I, I would say, um, I'm excited that it's been proclaimed <laughs> um, because I think it's giving us permission to like get unstuck, but I think that we have been there. Now, throughout this talk, I'm gonna talk about a bunch of different things and there's gonna be some images up here. All the images are from work I've done. Uh, as was introduced, the range of the things that I get called to do at times can be alarming. Um, it alarms my parents. They say, you're doing what? A black label bacon strip show? What is that? Or um, that ranging to the International Museum of Drug Policy. So these are very different things. But at the end of the day, what I am doing is figuring out how we create a piece of work that takes people from a digital experience to a live experience in a depthful, full way that is a journey. And then maybe they go back to that digital experience. Sometimes um, they don't. I don't really care if they do. What I care about is that when they come together from the, to this live experience, that something has brought them there, not that there's just an assumption that they're going to go there. So we'll talk a little bit more about what that means. Um, so like I said, I'm a big uh, person who thinks about constellations. I think of things in weird ways. I learned this a long time ago. My brain works in strange ways. And one of the things it does, I say this to my students, I taught at NYU Tisch, is if I make a statement like the art of experience empowers culture change, I want us to be like scientists and take it apart. What am I actually saying? Because I could say those words, they sound really nice. And then we could, I could show you some pictures of my art and I could say, and it empowers culture change. So um, I'm gonna take these words apart a little bit, which is just to say how art, culture change, experience empowers. And we're gonna try to break that down with some examples of what we do. 
Um, so just to give you a little bit more information on me and what uh, I do, um, my name is Michael Tara Garver. I run a creative studio called MTG, um, my initials, also the word for meeting. Um, and I also have just recently started um, a creative studio called 13 EXP, which is the first original content experiential studio with social impact in its DNA. Again, a lot of words. I'll explain what all those <laughs> mean together because they could be buzzwords. Um, so uh, the thing that, interesting, it's one ahead. That's funny. Um, the thing that uh, I am, ha, now it's there. Um, the thing that I am doing with MTG and 13EXP is twofold. One, with MTG, I get hired by brands, social impact, uh, sometimes theaters, sometimes organiza arts organizations to make things. They say we have, um, an, a, we, we're, we're launching a film and we'd like you to create an experiential campaign to go with this film. They don't know what they mean. They know that it's the age of experience after all, so they need that. And I have a tremendous amount of compassion for the fact that someone told them that it was the age of experience. <laughs> and so they realize they need this thing. Um, so I think the thing that I would just also remind you of is the age of experience holds all of these things, right? When we talk about the age of experience or what I get called into are meetings around all of these things. So that includes festivals, like right now. I've done work with festivals creating installations. Binge watching television. So who here has some binge watching they do on the Netflix or the, or the Amazons or the, anyone? No one. No one here. <laughs> wow, okay. All right, you can admit it, it's, it's all okay. Because the thing is, is actually what I would argue is the reason we're binge watching television is also experiential. We want deeper relationships. And something about doing that gives us a longer term relationship with characters, right? And, and it's a thing, it's a thing that's happening. Um, Pop-up activations. I make these, I don't think they work. But if you wanna pay me money to make them, I will. Um, and I do that a lot, but I've also come to the argument for a lot of brands, a lot of organizations, hey, like, this isn't working anymore. You know it's the age of experience. You need them, but no one is going to the five different pop-ups on a block in New York City where I live. Um, fandoms, cons, festivals, Comic-Con, uh, I don't, so many cons. There's so many cons now. Um, we'll talk a little bit about fandom as well, because that's a huge part of what I think about. Fandom goes back to what it really is, is relationship building. So all of this, at the end of the day, that I think about is, what is the thoughtful and real craft of relationship building that we're doing? Um, podcasts, uh, podcasts are a part of this age of experience. I know it sounds weird, because it's a podcast. The reason is, people are listening to a whole world, a whole universe, while they're walking around doing a lot of different things. I also think there is a huge amount of experience in that it is making cultural moments where people are connecting. So when I talk about experiential, I'm talking, again, about where live and digital things meet and make moments. So ARGs, right, there are these, the, do you know what ARGs, do we know what ARGs are? Um, has anybody heard of Pokemon Go? Right, there's people running around following vi virtual objects and then they're getting points and then they follow another one. That's an ARG. People like them. It did really well. I, I found it terrifying and so then I got really interested in how to make them work, which is usually what I do. Um, interactive technology, so VR, AR, those things. Um, civic engagement, one would say, so 85% in 2018, 85% of our population participated in some sort of civic engagement. 85%. Now I can't tell you what sort of civic engagement that was or who they were rallying for, but that's something to note. That's something to say that people wanted to show up for whatever that was. <laughs> um, 
Theme parks. So when we get to this experiential, as I'm uh, explaining it, I just would like to remind you that the reason Disney has taken over the world is they were the first and the best experiential. They've had parks, live things, and digital things from the beginning. So they've been doing this for a really long time. I know I have a lot of friends who work there. If anybody's seen, they're about to make like literally the Star Wars world. It's going to get a, uh, launched. Um, and then escape rooms. I uh, have very good friends who work in this field. I don't like escaping from rooms. I don't like being caught in rooms. I don't want to be caught in a room. I appreciate how much fun it is. But escape rooms are very popular because they're a thing you can do with your friends, and it turns out the name tells you what it is. So when someone else says, would you like to go to Sleep No More, if you've never heard of it, who has heard of it? Great, Sleep No More, big immersive production. I was a director on, and uh, an uh, associate director on in, in Boston. Um, but Sleep No More, when the words come out, now more people know, but um, they don't, it doesn't say what it is. In Escape Room, it says exactly what it is. So if it's scary, I know what it is, I go. Um, and then we're back again to this circle. So I would like to argue that what I'm making lies in the space between these circles. So what I'm interested in is the intersection of the best things about each of those to tell story. Um, that means that, hmm, nope, we're gonna, there we go. Um, that means that um, the art of experiential becomes about how you craft that. Experiential is not just an event. I think the misunderstanding is experiential has been thought of as a series of pop-ups or activations. And actually, the event is one piece of a larger constellation of strategies and stories and platforms and podcasts and socials and all of those things, not telling you to go to the event, but as another part of the experience. It's connected to all the different parts in a way that is depthful and makes the transaction that you want, the relationship to the brand, the relationship to the mission, the relationship to the story, an, an inevitable outcome. So the thing that this started from when I talk about experiences that move, um, was my beginnings in immersive theater. So these are some images from productions I made in Chicago. I was working in a basement and I started my theater company right after, right after September 11th. And um, I felt like I could not go out and raise money at that moment in time. And so there were two things I was doing. One was the art I was interested in was figuring out how to put people in spaces together and how to take them on a journey. And then the way I was interested in raising money was not asking people for money, but creating experiences in which they could spend money to, to be together, <laughs> separate from the theater. It was just about joy. Um, we started doing that, and two-thirds of our annual budget very quickly became built out of these experiences. We partnered with businesses in the city. We had relationships. We started making our theater that way, too. So we would start an experience in the back of a restaurant and take people on a journey down a back alley into a play called Faith Healer. Um, we, uh, if you're, that's what the image on the left is. Um, and then also, you know, for me it was about how do I put people inside the story and the experience they're having, and in that, might they start to share that experience much more with the people next to them. Then I kept going. So I've made work also on subways and in cars and um, sometimes at the top of buildings or throughout 16-story buildings. Um, I started to get really interested in how I could take the everyday, create these live site-specific experiences that were not um, trying to disrupt actually what was happening every day, but see if we could be surprised. So what is the poetry in our everyday? And um, this is a production called Empire Travel Agency we did in New York. We picked people up at these secret payphones they had registered to go on a trip. Uh, they were picked up at payphones that looked like actual payphones, thrown in a car, and suddenly were on a hunt throughout downtown um, New York for the special powder that was making New York City magical. 
And they met 40 characters. They got on trains. They went in buildings disused by Sandy. And we were running this, we were, we were running this three different shows at a time. So it was also kind of a logistical insanity. But those tools are the tools that over the last 20 years I've been building. And then we'll talk about this in a second. The last component of what I was building is how does technology become a component of performance? I got a little frustrated um, when I was working um, at American Repertory Theater, not because of American Repertory Theater, in Boston, um, because it was at a moment, it was about eight years ago, and everyone was saying, we have to get people to turn off the phones when they go into the theater. We must, we must get them to turn off their phones. How will we do it? How will they go into the theater and turn off their phones? And I thought, yes, absolutely. But maybe instead of telling people what to do, we have to make sure that we're engaging with that part of their lives. And if we do, then when it's time to put it away, they will feel seen and they will put it away. This was a theory. So I started kind of thinking about what kind of work I would want to make. And at the time, um, I was seeing a lot of amazing music in Boston. And, and people were put, sitting there watching music with their phones. And I was obsessed with uh, live music. I think it's one of the great magics we have. So I started a production that has led me and changed me on my path uh, called Fornicated. Actually, it was originally called Fornicated from the Beatles, but licensing and things, so it's Fornicated. Um, and, and Fornicated basically is a production which starts with texting. Characters text you over two months and culminate in live shows at different rock shows. And we could do it with a different band every night. It, we followed and built a script that had the story of 40 different characters. Um, and you can see them live at different moments and events. Uh, they might, let's say, if you were working with this festival, one of those characters may show up live. We had a team of 40 invisible performers who were doing all of the texting. And what we were really exploring was not, let's get rid of live performance to do this technology performance. We were actually really engaging in what makes these two things different. And if theater originally was a dialectic and it was about what it is to be human. We went, it was, it was incredible to go to theater in the beginning to see what it was to be human, to feel like somebody else understands, oh my goodness. Well, the thing is being human now, I don't care who you are. Technology is a part of being human now. It just is. And what I realized as a theater artist was I didn't want to deny it. I didn't want to live in it. I wanted to try to grapple with it. So Fornicated kind of led me down this rabbit hole. I ended up doing work for bands, a band called Great Caesar, actually based out of Madison, Connecticut. Speaking of Connecticut, um, one of my good friends who lives there, Great Caesar was going to South by Southwest. We did 18 shows in eight days, and we created a whole journey through texting that led to these discovery of live shows. We built a fan base, going back to fandom, uh, that tripled their showcase in size at the end. And for anybody who's been to South by Southwest, imagine a festival where every place you go, if you, it, it feels like you're like clapping amidst like 16 orchestras playing and you want people to hear you clapping. So the thing about South by is how do people hear you? How do they connect? And the other part of this that was really important for me was this was an album they were releasing that had been, you could, you've actually heard about it on NPR if you've listened to certain podcasts. Um, they had created this album in collaboration with multiple artists at a prison in Marion, Ohio. And so not only was it compelling and interesting to me to figure out how we got them fans to listen, but who could come to the table and listen in a way that was joyful, but also really listen. And so with Fornicated, the bands and with this said, no one has listened to us more. And no one is engaging with their phones more. They're listening to us in a huge way. So um, I've used a lot of words, as it says here, um, and I just want to say these are all the words that get used around the things that I do, right? Lots of words. I'm not going to go into them all today, and part of what I've been doing in the last year is writing a book about how experience is, uh, the art of experience works so that it shifts to culture change. But all of these things, the reason why these words are important is because they make things different. For example, when you go to the museum, and you walk through, and it's a promenade, and you're walking through, and sometimes maybe there might be a live installation, but that installation doesn't interact with you. That's promenade. It's not immersive. It's simply walking by live things, right? At the theme park, similarly. But 
in a theme park, when, it, it, when they interact with you, I would argue it is now engaging another one of these words, which is interactive. So us just making sure that we're using the words that mean the things versus what happens now, which is every commercial you listen to, everything's immersive, everything's experiential. Who has heard a commercial that tells you that this something is immersive? Anything, literally, my car is immersive. It's all immersive and experiential, right? But really, there are so many words that are a part of that. This also means that I've been called a lot of things. I've been called all of these things, an immersive artist, an artivist, because I do a lot of work which we'll talk about around social justice, um, a theater director, that was fun. For a while, that's actually what I did. I got my master's in it, and I taught it at NYU to Tisch students. Um, installation artist, environmental artist, story systems writer, that was a new one. Uh, a designer, it's true, an immersive consultant, um, a divisor, community facilitator, and a director. Um, so the thing is, is that just gives you an idea that experiential, the reason going back to why when I go into places, people are, um, they say they want this age of experience, but they don't know what they want. It's because it's a lot of things. If we've made the, anything clear yet, I hope, it's a lot of things. So for me, the art of experience is how do we get more craftful about what we actually mean? And the first step for me was coming up with a name that I could hold on to. So I am an experiential architect. I had to name what I do, right? I make big things, I use lots of different stuff, I make the map for it, I make the art of it, and I lead it. And that can look very different depending upon the journey you're trying to take someone through. Um, this word uh, has both has been helpful for me in a lot of ways, in that I realized as I named that, um, it started to allow me to say, I'm gonna use the different building tools that are a part of making experience across live and digital. Um, so I just want to, for a second, just because it's fun, talk a little bit about the way commercials and brands are using this. Um, this is a picture of the 100th, 50th anniversary of Gettysburg. Below that is the picture of one of the AMC immersive upfronts that I did. Um, we made another one where you walked inside of the experiences of Mad Men, Breaking Bad, Walking Dead. Um, and then, uh, because it's just fun to do, this is the Black Label Bacon Strip Show. Um, Really, all the jokes have been done, bringing home the bacon, all of the things. Um, so I'll just show you this so you get a sense of the absurdity. Bacon advertising sucks. You can't taste TV, touch billboards, see radio, smell digital, or hear print. So how do you launch four new flavors of bacon? You give them their own show on the Vegas Ladies Strip. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Black Label Bacon Strip Show. We brought Broadway's finest talent together to really get bacon shaken. Our invitation was a bacon strip tease. Lower, lower, lower. But I'm so passionately, aggressively wanting what's inside. Black label bacon strip show. You should come. We enticed prominent bacon lovers to attend a sold out, <laughs> one night only, one of a kind performance, headlined by our four new flavors of bacon. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. We got brown sugar. My man, the whiskey soap. Pecan one. Last but not least, the fiery, the spicy jalapeno. Yes! <laughs> the entire event was live streamed on the Vegas Strip's largest digital billboard and online to over 30 countries. It was a sensory overload. And everyone ate it up. Okay, so I can't say that I made that video um, a advertising agency made that video. I find it hilarious every time I watch it. But I really enjoyed making numbers where someone came out and there was a love story between bacon and eggs. So um, it was actually an experience that for me, one of the things that I've done in the art of experiential is work like that. The reason I show it is 
you know, artists, what I'm doing is I'm working in artists in so many different fields, in so many different ages, in so many different spaces, and I want them to know that what they're doing matters. We unfortunately or fortunately live in a society which we should honor values things with money. That's what we do, we pay for things. Now, I don't think that is the value of our humanity. I don't think that's actually what is important. But for young artists, in particular as a teacher, one of the things I'm always trying to say is, when there are moments where there is money, the priority should be that the makers and creators are who is being paid. And so one of the ways that I've done the work with brands is basically saying, great, yeah, you can work with me, I'm gonna make you this amazing experience within the age of experience, but I am going to utilize those resources and your artists are going, you're gonna get the best artists because they will always work with me because they're paid well. I mean, it's just that simple. <laughs> and, and I'm going to take care of them in a big way and they are going to do the most joyous performance for you you've ever seen. They're gonna bring their creativity to the table, not because it's money, but because they're being valued and because they understand what it is. So there's that part of my life, right, where I'm making sure. And then there's the other part of experience in our lives where we're talking about culture change. So what is culture change? I have no time to explain all of what culture change is, except for the fact that what I want to talk about is that really in the moment we're in. So we're in the age of experience, we've established that. We are also in a moment where the word culture is complicated. It means a lot of things. Culture means um, what, uh, what a, a community shares together the way they work and are together. Culture means the habits and narratives that we've embedded into who we are and who we wanna be. And um, culture means a lot of things to a lot of different people. So when we talk about culture change, I think it's like one thing. It's, called, it's culture change, like if it could be a word, right? And the reason is because right now, I think about um, each of these movements, if you look, uh, being in college, a little over 20 years ago watching Will and Grace compared to this moment right now, which is the 50th anniversary of Stonewall. And if you look around, the amount of different ways that that is being represented. I was walking down the street in New York yesterday and every single window in Macy's was, was themed after Stonewall. For me, it, I get chills again. I thought to myself, like this, wouldn't, this is different. Something is different here. We are shifting something. Change is happening. Now, that is not to say that there isn't brutality, that there isn't homophobia, that there aren't issues, but it is to say that because in culture we are bringing out all of these conversations, there is a way for culture change to exist. The biggest challenge is we don't have spaces where we can have a dialogue about this stuff. There's a lot of new change coming at us, but the dialogue spaces. So for me, experiential, which brings a lot of opinions together, has the potential to do that. I don't know if you guys know this, but when they see us, is the, has been up until now, the large, the most highest viewed um, series on Netflix. That's insane. Um, does everybody know what when they see us is? If you don't, it's okay. It's about the Central Park Five and um, it was made by Ava DuVernay and it's on Netflix right now. It's incredible and heartbreaking and awful and terrible and true and about who we are and important. And people at home are not being asked to watch it, they are choosing to watch it. That to me says something else. Um, the NBA is doing work inside of prisons. I'm right now about to work on a large scale experience going across the country around uh, criminal justice reform that's engaged with a huge amount of different heavy hitting artists. These are things that now culturally we're talking about. And I point to this to just say there's a moment, right? There's the Women's March, which was a moment. And, and for me, um, a moment which my friends led and I was able to be of help and of service to them in that leadership, but it is a moment where people, where they, they came together for an experience of a desire for change. And now the challenge we're in is we're past that moment, right? We're in the moment now where we have to figure out how to feel actually productive in that, how to feel like we're taking steps forward. We've, we've de announced and said we need to do things and so then the question is what, 
it has been 18 years since the UN General Assembly has met um, around drug policy. Ladies and gentlemen. 18 years ago, a huge amount of international drug policy no instigated yes, that ultimately much. failed. I, so I start with what's the end goal? Where are we going? And then I also ask where we have, have we been? And a story is ultimately taking us from where we've been to where we're going. And so then it's how do we create an experience that doesn't push people there, doesn't pull them there, but gives them directed freedom to find their way there because they want to. The museum itself, in conjunction with the General Assembly, is to create not only a space where we're memorializing the past, but also a place where people could come, in which all of the voices of this issue can be heard. A space to reconsider an idea. And the thing about museums that's really interesting is some of our challenges with museums is how precious they can be. But to think of a museum of drug policy and to create it under construction is that it allows people to kind of to, to look at something new that they wouldn't before. The way people will relate to these experiences is so unique. The feeling of scale to also then the feeling of intimacy and the feeling of no space allows the viewer to feel like something is transforming and makes them really aware of where they are. There's this sense always in those details, people might notice it, they might not, but if they get close, they see what's underneath. The real impact of these events is A, the really beautiful human moments that happen when people are here, but then to place themselves inside of it, to really mark the experience that they had, that's when they start sharing it. And when that message then gets shared, people ask questions about it. I want to go to a place in which I'm going to be in a space that feels revelatory. As long as that action is clear, as long as where we want people to go is clear, we can really use installation and this work to get there. So obviously very different than Bacon. Um, and, and what was super transformative for me, and you know, going back, Fornicated was transformative for me in making that around realizing how people would come together if I acknowledged their technology and brought them together around live magic experiences with music. Um, actually, Bacon was transformative in the way that I really saw in that moment how culturally, every all the way to Hormel, people were craving live experiences that basically is Broadway theater, let's be honest, which I come up from, right? But that they really needed it. And, and then in the same way that the same kinds of questions need to be asked, not the same answer, but the same kinds of curiosity and questions need to be asked when a group are coming together from around the world to have a conversation about something as complex as drug policy. And the only way to live in that complexity, 40 different languages, right? The, the issue of drug policy is not as simple as our understanding in the US. In fact, it is much different. And to actually create a space where I would walk through and hear different languages happening, where I would see people sitting inside the cocoa hut and having a meeting and putting their feet in the dirt. These were things that made me realize that actually experiential starts to go across language as well. Um, so uh, I also, we made the Museum of Drug Policy as well uh, as the museum, we made it to tour. So it became the Museum of Drug Policy Museum in a Box and it toured to Montreal. The back wall was a stained glass that I created called The Heart of the Matter, made out of pill bottles, and uh, light was behind it from the window, and um, basically from inside it looked like a stained glass, and from outside you could put different notes of people you'd lost or things, people or, that have been impacted for you um, through issues of drugs. Um, another thing that started to happen was me thinking about how civic engagement could be involved, and so, this is a project that I started four years ago in North Carolina in Winston-Salem. Uh, we are designing a trailer that can go to different parking lots to create hubs of energy and entertainment 
using solar power and also connecting jobs to solar power and to solar farms. Um, and so the thing that for me was super interesting was, what, was that this is the way my brain worked. Uh, that's not interesting. What's interesting is that the way my brain worked of thinking, well, okay, so people come together in parking lots. That's where they already are coming together. What would create a hub to bring them together and stay? Interesting, in North Carolina, they're all going through Walmart parking lots. What is Walmart doing? They're putting solar panels on their roof. What would, you know, these are the, this is the way the curiosity in those questions happened for me. And what I would argue stops culture change is the fact that we just talk about it. I think a lot of times right now, there's a lot of messages. There's a lot of people telling you what's wrong. There's a lot of people standing up like this, talking at you, right? Here I am, I'm doing the same thing. But there's a lot of people telling you things. They're saying, this is what's wrong in the environment. This is what's happening in this issue. Here's what's happening in this issue. We have to make a change, we have to do this. But we're not being given, not that it's everybody's job to do so, but we're not always feeling like we know what to do literally what actions to take. It feels so big and so complicated, because it is. And so one of the arguments I would think, I would say that stops culture change is that actions and words are often separate. And I look at that like digital and live. We have a lot of tweeting, a lot of social media, a lot of words going out there, people sharing things, influencers, all that stuff. And then we have live things, and they have action involved in them. We have marches, we have coming together and convenings, we have meetings, we have festivals, people are flocking to festivals. Why are these two things not integrated in a way that values them as unique parts of how we move together? So um, I think that when asked of how we don't stop culture change, the first thing I would say is make sure you first, for lack of a better term, disrupt yourself. <laughs> so go to places and put yourself in a situation where the only thing you can do is listen. By that I mean um, you are definitively an outsider in this space. It is not your job to speak, it is not your job to tell people, it is not your job to um, solve, hard one. It is not your job, to, it is your job to listen. Um, step two, listen. Don't go there to listen and think about what you would change. Don't go there to listen and be ready to say something. Listen. And the thing about the experiences that I'm creating, I'll be honest, are often trying to create a space where people can feel safe doing number one and number two. It's terrifying. It means we are stepping into the unknown. In a space where I don't stand up here and I say something, <laughs> in a space that I walk into where I don't have expertise, or even a thing I feel, that's terrifying. Because we're in the unknown of it. What are we supposed to say? And then the last thing is to be curious. So everything that I'm doing is about cultivating a deep sense of curiosity. And how do we cultivate curiosity, right? The way we cultivate curiosity is that there is a way, um, there's a couple things. One, you experience humanness in all its forms. So we don't say humanness is just this one thing. Um, I know I'm talking about a lot of big ideas, but we, we often do say, you know, uh, well, being human or it's because she's sad or I'm happy or this is what a festival is or this is what this thing is. We, we define what things are. The other, this, I spoke about this in the thing, in the um, video, in doing that, what I think about is how can we be floor keepers, not door keepers, right? So there's a lot of talk about doorkeepers are people who say, please come into my house, here's the door, I want welcome you all. <laughs> the problem is it's still my house. And how can we craft experiences that instead of me saying, please come into my house, I, I welcome you through this door, how do we create a space that is expansive? Again, all of this sounds very theoretical. Um, but all of this is what goes into the complexity and thinking behind the work that I'm making, which I will get to very quickly. Um, I think a lot about story sharing over storytelling. Um, how do we create ways where people can share parts of a story? And now I'm gonna talk about how we do it. 
Um, if we are creating new story systems, which is one of the things I argue, we are trying to shift the way narratives work, um, how we build it is how it is experienced. So if I say, I'm going to make spaces where we are floor keepers, not door keepers, and then I stand in front of a room and I tell everyone what to do, that is not what's going to happen, right? So in the making of it, it has to be floor keeping. One of the projects I made is a piece called Alexandria. This one has a special place in my heart. We're still developing it with the New York Public Library. Um, Alexandria, who knows about the Library of Alexandria? Yes, so Library of Alexandria, first library on record. Yes, there's a lot of disagreements about it. Things I'm gonna say are not actual facts because no one really knows why. The only reason we know about the Library of Alexandria is because we have records of it being burned down. We have no records of it existing. This became fascinating to me. I was like, what? How, if that's how we record things, that kind of feels like right now. It feels like we're looking at things because they're on fire. We're not actually looking at the thing, right? And then I thought, okay, and this is a thing I tend to do, where are spaces where people already are going, they're easy for people to go to, and also they are scalable, which means they're in every city, every town, libraries, interesting, also happens to be where I wanted to be every Saturday when I was a kid and probably on Sundays as well. So we created a project called Alexandria where audiences, um, while a library was running, we had 16 simultaneous tracks, which means 16 different experiences that were happening at the same time while the library was functioning throughout a building. You showed up, you gave your, li you gave your library card, and you were given a card catalog number that sent you on a journey to installations, actors, stories, and the idea was you were in search of our lost stories. We're partnering now with VR companies and a bunch of different technology companies where throughout public libraries, there will be live installations as well as the ability to go inside some of these lost stories and working in particular with women and um, underserved voices, people of color, um, LBGTQ communities in different spaces and this is a structure that will then continue to be able to replicate and highlight those stories and let you experience them. So it's about unearthing um, stories that we feel have been lost. Everything in the work that we're doing, so this was on a bookshelf. Everything we're using VR, but we're also using shadow puppets. To me, it's about, it, we're also having live moments. There was a woman who does a scene from a book, you know, library book drops, remember those? You went to the library book drop and you opened it up and she was living inside of it. She decided to live there. Um, and she herself was a lost story. So to me, it's about using all of those things to make it happen. This is how it works. So this is the back end of how I make this work. So when I say 16 simultaneous tracks, this is our script. Now there's a scene in each of those squares and those scenes are written by 30 writers. So I worked with 30 writers on this. And why I point this out is not to make your brain hurt, but it is to say this also means we're solving one of the other culture change challenges, which is how do we create narrative systems, right? We can't say like, my story is the story. This is the only story about family, this is it. That's kind of what we've been doing. Instead, we're saying many stories are the story. There is a fabric of stories that are the story. And they're all happening simultaneously. How do we experience that? Um, I have another project I created, clearly I like civic spaces, called Post Nation. Um, this is a piece where audiences start in a, a disused post office. They wait in line at the post office, which is our favorite thing to do. But interestingly, our post offices are one of the most just, there's no hierarchy at the post office, right? There's no VIP line, no one gets to go in front. It's just that line, and we know we're gonna be there for a while. And people perform at the post office. They yell, they do things they wouldn't do in other spaces. So we created this uh, project that started in lines in post offices that we would work, and throughout that there'd be characters who were performing throughout the line. We had 16 writers, um, 12 of who were undocumented. Uh, so a lot of this was around questions of immigration and migration, and then uh, six of whom spoke different languages. So this was not about one community, this was about what does it mean when we're all bashing up against each other? Um, again, just to give you an idea, so you wait in line and then you get up to the front and you've watched these characters and you've interacted with them and you give your postal slip and they give you a notice that says, um, you're, uh, you're, you have a P.O. box and your P.O. box is being, I'm gonna forget the word right now, but basically shut down. We're shutting down your P.O. box. 
we are disengaging it. This is a true term, even though I'm forgetting the term, in the postal system. I also got super nerdy about post offices. I studied them for eight years as I was building this. Our postal system is exceptional and a mess. And it is exactly a metaphor of our country. It is a massive system in which people are moved through and things are moved through, and we are very proud of it. We used to show this at like fairs around the world and be like, look at our postal systems. It is the example of democracy. You used to be able to mail people in the early days of the postal system. There are pictures. You could put an address on a person, and you trusted the system so much, you would take that child, it was children, to the, your postman, and you would say, <laughs> also, our postal systems were utilized as deportation spaces. So our postal systems were this big metaphor the more I dug into them. They were also the first uh, federal organizations to hire women and people of color, but they put them in the back. So the thing about it was, as I dug deeper, wow, there's all these stories. And so what we also started to do is once you went back and you got your slip and you went to your P.O. box, you actually walk, now it's theatrical, you walk back in time through piles and piles of letters to the back in a sorting space. And you open your P.O. box and there's a letter there and it's a dead letter. You've been learned about dead letters in the process of the show. In our country, um, we will throw away people, but we will not throw away letters. It's illegal. So... In that, I thought, well, you get this choice. You've learned that there's a huge thing that happens if you throw away this letter. So you can either choose to deliver it, you can choose to rip it up, please don't, or you could choose to open it. That's illegal, you'll probably get arrested. And so we, we through all these different experiences, most people chose to deliver it, and then they get put in trucks. Um, and these people became shipments and they're carrying these letters to deliver them. And we sort them, and um, just again, to show you how we make it models what we're doing, we were building it at first with the Goodman Theater in Chicago, so we were building the whole thing. I worked on it for two years there. And I ran a theater company in Chicago for eight years, so it's home for me in a lot of ways. Um, and the way we built this was we, I get, again, super nerdy, and I went into what were the top nine population numbers in Chicago that grew through immigration or migration moments. And through that, then we mapped through time what those big movements were. Keeps going. And that was how we shifted, and oh, I skipped it, but we built all of our characters to model that time frame. So, Basically, the structure inside of it, much like a postal system, has this DNA of all these things that collided together. You follow this letter, you go learn the stories of those people, you go take a truck through the city, you're seeing different experiences of the city, and you end up together with people who have come from different post offices at what we actually have in our country, an installation, not an installation, a theatrical installation version of dead letter centers. So we have throughout our country dead letter spaces because we cannot throw away these letters. And so when a letter becomes disused, a post office gets to decide how many times that they will then, they will then put it into the graveyard of letters. Imagine for a second. Think about that. <laughs> I did a lot. I thought that was fascinating. The other thing being there was a period of time where if a community, if a person immigrated here, it's not like they're, the person they were immigrating, the person at home, said, oh, you're moving to Los Angeles at this address. They were just going to Los Angeles. Same with migration. I'm going to Chicago. So a letter that would get sent would say to Michael in Los Angeles. Think of all the letters. Think of it for a second. And this became a huge idea for us of, again, how we keep and honor um, I talked about fornicated. I'll just show you some images of it because they're fun and I like them. Um, a big thing with this was starting where people began. As you saw in that last image, I don't think it's going to go back. Um, you got to choose who you were going to follow at the beginning. So this is a character, Layla. And then you were texting with her, but you were actually texting with invisible performers. You ended up at the club. And all that lighting that you're seeing, that beautiful lighting, is done by other people standing next to her with flashlights. So imagine that a rock show was happening, a band was playing up front, they would hit the downbeat of a part of a song, and suddenly they would stop, 
and the flashlight would come up on Layla and she would have a microphone that was hidden more than this one and she would be starting to talk like she's whispering to the person next to her and then the band would start up again. So it was like surround sound having this experience. It was like living inside. And the thing about it for me was my fascination with how we could actually go to spaces like this and remember that people are alive around us. People are having their own lives and their own stories. And I know um, that seems obvious, but in the oversaturation of the world that we're living in, it's hard to do that. Because if you do it, it's really exhausting. There's so much, it's exhausting. And so how could we articulate that? So just going back, um, if you notice a pattern, music festivals, post offices, libraries, I start where people actually are, right? I'm interested in where they actually are going to go. I, I am not interested in, in trying to make, in trying to force people places. I wanna make work around where community is comfortable going. Um, I also build in interactions that are real. I don't tell you, you at this moment are a person who is the father of this ghost you are interacting. Sorry, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but BS. Like, I would say not BS, I would say the word. But, you know, you're not. And then I say no, and then I don't believe you, and then I'm not having a good experience. The reason that theater works as it has is the agreement is clear. The agreement here is clear, right? It got a little dark out there. You kind of are pretty sure, unless I'm a jerk, I'm not gonna pick somebody out and make them do something. You're in the dark, I'm up here, I do the thing, and you're safe to have your experience. But as we shift the rules of what those experiences are, we can't suddenly go, well now, this is what I want you to do and you should know what that is. That's actually manipulative and abusive. That doesn't model the behavior that we want. So interactive and immersive theater gets a bad rap because that's often what happens. It's really hard to give people freedom and then they don't do what you want. But it does mean that if you build trust with them, if you spend the time building trust, which is what we work a lot on, it will work. Um, and people talk a lot about this word scaling. I bring it up because they talk about it all the time. Um, if scaling is in the DNA of the thing, like about post offices, if it's about, we have a project with veterans in cycling classes, and we can scale to different soul cycles because we want to, because that's a part of the DNA of the story with veterans and their power and strength, then it works. If you try to do a show in a place that's about one specific place, and then you say, but now I want to do it there, and I want to do social with it, I want to do all these things, or I want to make the social media work with this thing, in my, argu my argument is it doesn't work. It has to be in the DNA of the thing, much like how the social impact in what I do is in the DNA of the work I'm making. It's who the authors are, it's the questions we're asking, it's the things that we're grappling with. Um, it's messy doing this work, it's not easy. And so a lot of issues around safety come up, which I just started to talk about. If you have questions about those, I can talk more about them, but I do think all of this work as we start getting outside of the boundaries of what we know happens at a museum, what we know happens at a talk, what we know happens at a theatrical production, what we know happens at a festival. As those things shift, um, artists have to be responsible to model the way that they wanna develop that relationship. And I, um, and on the boards of all the immersive design summits and groups and all of those things. And challengingly, you know, because as we went back to those circles, there's so many different worlds that are participating in this. The question of safety and how we treat each other and how we treat our audiences is the next big question. In my mind, it's the only question, but there you go. Um, so going back, how the art of experience empowers culture change, I'm gonna tell you what my answer has been. Uh, about a year ago, I launched a studio called 13EXP. 13EXP creates um, live and digital experiential pilots as a destination. So um, as I talk to you about all this experiential stuff, all of those things were driven by an, a brand or an organization. So it's basically like I am in an industry, in a creative industry that's only made as commercials. A brand says I wanna do a thing, they pay for it, it gets done. There's no television. There's no thing that gets created, even in the way arts organizations are doing it. They commission the thing, they usually can't make it, right? Because this is so complex and it lives on different levels. So I realized that we needed to create a space where we took all this work that I've been commissioned and IP, and so I've launched 13AXP. Um, in the first 
uh, we have to disrupt the way that this work is being made if we want to disrupt the way we're experiencing it. We have projects everywhere from Fornicated, which I've talked about, Alexandria, Hashtag Revolution. We have a project called The Superflow, which is a female hip hop superhero uh, universe. Um, Janet Jackson Saves the Universe, a project that I developed with 12 students, uh, sorry, 22 students in Montclair, first generation millennial, first generation immigrant millennial writers and artists, um, using Janet Jackson's Rhythm Nation as a culmination, uh, but also a pretty extraordinary piece to develop with them. I also built a team of like people who, like Carrie Twig, who worked in the White House, in Obama's White House, in culture, and Ivan Asquith, who focuses on fandom, and Tracy Sturdivant, who focuses on community engagement. So we're, for the first time, from the beginning, building a creative, an original content studio. Think like the way movie studios used to be, where they'd make a slate of things. Um, we are doing that, we have done that, and all of the projects are original, all of them have a diverse set of writers, and they all are experiences that have live and digital components, some for festivals, whatever that is, and they all have social impact in their DNA. The idea in that is that that's a financial reasoning, also our creators are getting um, the highest percentage in terms of return on that. So it's a business that I'm building basically to model that we can make impactful, valued um, work. I'm almost done, I'm about to do it. Uh, I've made the time. So how does the art of experience empower culture change? Um, so I would say that we need to make uh, new constellations. So if you look at the logo of 13 AXP, the reason is I always say that what I, even from like the first time I made a production at Northwestern University and I was asked to direct something, I said, what I want is that thing where you feel really small amidst something really big. I think that's what it is to feel human. Not that you feel like you own everything, but that you feel present and you feel small amidst that network. So to me, the work I'm making is a constellation each time. Each project is an IP ecosystem, that's the business term. But the artful term is it's a constellation, which means you might only touch two to three parts of it, but when you step back, and the further you step back, you see that you are a part of this extraordinary larger thing. And you feel connected to something larger. Um, in that, um, to me, I think that architecting constellations become, these become our new North Stars. This becomes the way we tell new narratives, for me. And I've seen it start to happen. Um, so the last thing I'll say uh, is a big thank you to all of you who came inside at 3.30 p.m. Uh, and sat in the dark. Um, I know I sh threw a lot at you. <laughs> Michael, thank you so much. Um, everyone, thank you for joining us for thank our you. final Ideas event. Thanks, guys. Thank you.